You're listening to Language Nerds Do Earth, the podcast about linguistics, culture, travel, and how they're all connected. Now it's time for your language nerd hosts. One in China, one in Spain. It's Patrice and Rachel. Language Nerds to Earth. You are listening to episode number 17. Yes, indeed, yo. <laughs> Coming at you hot. <laughs> Literally hot. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, super hot here in China. Yeah, in Spain it's... Actually, it hasn't been too bad, but it's, it's going to get there. Yeah. We've been in the 90s for, like, the past week, and, like, the humidity factor is just... It's pretty intense. That's the good thing about Spain is the humidity is kind of non-existent, at least in Madrid. That's good. So it's really dry, but it's hot. Well, but you guys don't really have AC. I guess no. that's the only downside. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. <laughs> we live for the AC here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this week we are talking about a pretty uncomfortable topic, actually. Yeah, so we're talking about... You know, that moment when someone asks you where you're from and you tell them and then they say, no, but where are you from? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. So we have a very interesting guest um, Mm -hmm. that we'll hear from in a bit. He'll talk about that experience. We also Mm -hmm. have a little bit of uh, food for thought on race itself. Mm Mm-hmm. And what it is and what it means. And since we're both white, privileged American women, we are obviously experts on the topic. Obviously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, obviously we're not claiming to be experts, but we try to educate ourselves and, yeah. uh, and be aware. Yeah, so this should be a pretty interesting topic, mm-hmm. but... First, we have some language news. Ooh, language news. <laughs> gimme, gimme, gimme. So this week we read an article from the New York Times about gratitude mm-hmm. and expression of gratitude. Yeah, this really surprised me, actually. <laughs> yeah. So the article is based on a study of basically like informal language and informal conversations from, I think they studied eight languages from around the world, studying how often people say thank you. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, in informal situations, it was only about one in 20 situations. That's amazing. Yeah. I was really surprised by that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know what it is, I think, in another language, I say thank you all the time. Yeah. Especially here in China. Like, the guard opens the gate for me. Thank you. Somebody gives me food. Thank you. Somebody drops me off at a place. Thank you. But <laughs> uh, but when I'm speaking English, I guess it's true. Like, I don't have a lot of conversations where thank you is, like, the main reason I'm speaking. So. Yeah. I think, and what they're talking about is, like interactions with friends with family mm-hmm. right, um, where they do something for you and you don't say thank you huh. but what was really interesting was the researchers weren't really surprised by this because basically it shows that our basic setting is to reciprocate favors and things like that huh. or requests oh. instead of like focusing on the act itself well yeah it's kind of like we expect it like they Mm -hmm. do something for us and you know if I ask you can you pass the plate Uh okay yeah you're gonna do it Mm -hmm. and you might say thank you or you might not Mm -hmm. they're just a lot of simple things so what they found was that requests were complied with seven times more often than they were not so people were most of the time complying with a request. Huh. So that's like the 
the basic setting that we have is to yeah. comply with the request. You don't really necessarily expect a thank you. Or uh, an expression like good job or sweet or like an acknowledgement of that right. act. Yeah, those were included in the verbal expressions of thank you as well. Which is amazing. I mean, maybe as a teacher, maybe I'm different. Maybe I'm a special snowflake. I don't know. But I feel like I try to give people positive feedback when they do something for me. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's just like a habit that I have. Or maybe I don't. Now I'm I'm really going to start thinking about that as I go yeah, about my week. Yeah, but if you're talking about work, that might be more of a formal setting. No, yeah, no. I'm I'm talking about day to day. And I don't know if that's what I do. Yeah, it's interesting. It'll be interesting in the next week or so to see yeah. if we can notice that about ourselves. Right. Yeah, that will be really interesting. Because I don't know. I also feel like I try to say thank you for little things, but I'm sure there are ones that I miss. Right. Do you say thank you when Emilio does the dishes? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if Seth does the dishes, I'm, I'm like, thank you. Or... Yeah, but I think even smaller things like hand me the butter or something. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, it's not like a huge... I see. Yeah. yeah. Huh. I don't know. Well, we'll have to see. Yeah, definitely. So the languages that they studied were English, Italian, Polish, Russian, Lao, Chapala, spoken oh. in Ecuador, um, <laughs> Morin Patha, Sounds good. an Aboriginal language of, in Australia, and Siwu, spoken in Ghana. Huh. So... They had a good mix of languages from more Western countries, from more indigenous, smaller languages, mm -hmm. from yeah. northern. That's true. Like Russian. Yeah, they really took a large variety. They didn't just look at like Mandarin, German, Spanish, English, and French. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Yeah. So they think that from evolution... This makes sense because we do expect uh, help from close family and friends. So it's not something that like is out of the ordinary that you need to be thanking them for. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you expect it. Well, you know what's interesting? Um, in Chinese culture, you don't thank family. Like, huh? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Actually, when you say thank you, the common response is which means no no polite, no need to be polite, or xie, no, no need to thank me. And basically, they're saying there's no thanks expected. Uh -huh. But you can thank strangers. Like, that's, I don't know, that's the way it's been explained to me before. So, okay. I mean, that's Mandarin, that's, that's China. And I wonder if, like, there's any kind of, similarity in other cultures where where thanks isn't as important as maybe we think it is yeah the article did talk about that so in western culture there's this like strong ideology about giving thanks mm -hmm. and actually in english and in italian they said words for gratitude more huh Ah. But it's it also mentioned that a lot of languages either lack a word for thank you. <gasps> um, wow. Such as, is it Dothraki? Oh, is yeah. Game of Thrones listeners? Yes, it is Dothraki. <laughs> doesn't have a word for thank you. Wow. <laughs> but a lot of actual real languages as well. <laughs> but that that's interesting. Um, I wonder if that must have been on purpose that the creators of Dothraki didn't make a word for thank you it must have been yeah so the implication of giving thanks varies among cultures so you said in china you don't thank family mm -hmm. and it mentioned that in a lot of southeast asian cultures it can actually be it can be insulting to give thanks huh. or to say thank you and in some cultures um it's only for like really momentous things like saving someone's life yeah wow but not like you know, bringing you your food or something. Huh. Yeah. But expressing gratitude with thank you uh, verbally does not mean, like, feeling it more. Yeah. That's what they said. Oh. 
Yeah, I mean, it's so important for us in Western culture to express thanks outwardly, but we are also a very low context culture in the U.S., so Mm -hmm. that means that not a lot goes unsaid, Mm -hmm. whereas in the East, I mean... There's not a there's not a line down the middle of the globe that divides high context and low context cultures, but in high context cultures, what is said matters at least as much as what is not said. Right. And so I never thought of the fact that I could be overusing thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's like a compulsion that you have to do it. Right, right. But anyway, really interesting article, Rachel. Good find there. Yeah, and actually what I thought was interesting, they didn't include any children in the study because they thought it might sway the results. Yeah. So because children are like, they have this idea stuffed into their brain or whatever that they have to say thank you all the time, especially probably in Western culture. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Well, pay attention to how often you're really saying thank you. Yeah, Yeah. let us know. It'll be interesting to see. (laughs) I'm definitely going to start thinking about it now. Yeah, Hmm. me too. Okay, so this week we wanted to talk about race. Before we bring in Peter, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we view race as human beings. Mm -hmm. I remember my first anthropology class in college And my professor said, race doesn't exist. And I remember thinking, what are you saying? (laughs) Because, you know, I'm 17. I was like my first semester in college. And, uh, And she said, look, you have a continuum of like the darkest person you'll ever see to the lightest person you'll ever see. And then like in between them, there are an infinite number of people who are each shade between the dark and light. Where is the boundary? Where are the white people and where are the black people? Or not black people, you know? Where do you Mm -hmm. say, like, this person's a white person, this person's a non-white person? And that kind of blew my mind. Well, yeah, it's interesting, especially, I think, whiteness Mm -hmm. was constructed, especially in the the Americas, as... A power tool. Mm -hmm. So if you were white, you had the power. And to a large extent, that has remained true. Mm. So that's why we see, especially like in the United States, if you were mixed between African-American and white, you're black. Right. You're not white. Yeah. If you were a quarter black, you're black. Right. You're not white, even though you're three quarters quote unquote white. Yeah. Tiger Woods and Barack Obama are both black, even though they're a combination of different races. Right. They're mixed. Yeah. They're a mixed race. And it was really interesting. So the article that you found about race in Brazil mm-hmm. and comparing that to the United States. Yeah. So basically, yeah, what we were talking about in the United States, if you're part black, you are black. Yeah. But in Brazil, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so in Brazil, slavery was a lot more widespread than it was in the U.S., which is kind of mind-blowing to think about. Slavery ended in Brazil in 1888, and the number of Africans always outnumbered the number of Portuguese. And Portuguese men probably fathered more offspring with African slaves than with Portuguese women. And actually in Brazil, apparently they say that everyone has one foot in the kitchen, which is a phrase that means that everybody has an ancestor who was an African slave. Yeah. So Brazilians don't think about race the same way Americans do. And uh, they say that Americans classify too many people as black. Like they still talk about race a lot in Brazil, but there's... You know, every color of the rainbow in Brazil, and I think the proportions are much bigger of non-white people. Yeah, and for United States standards, it would be they classify too many people as as white, no? In Brazil. Yeah, something like that. But they also use the word pardo. Yeah. We would say mixed, but it's a term that's rarely used in everyday speech in Brazil, so... So 
yeah, why are we talking about all this, right. actually? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a few months ago, I was at a party, and I started talking to this friend. What's your name? Peter. And where are you from? I am from London, UK. And, and what's your heritage? My family are originally from Egypt. They're actually born in Sudan, below Egypt, but the family heritage is all Egyptian from the past, yeah. So that makes you first-generation English. Yes. So Peter has a really interesting backstory, actually. He was born and raised in London, but there is a stark contrast between his home life and England life. So first we talked a little bit about how he grew up kind of in the middle of two worlds. How did that influence your growing up, the fact that your family was Egyptian? Quite heavily. I mean, I grew up in a very English neighborhood, uh-huh. quite different cultures. It's a huge culture shock when you grow up with a family who, you know, my family grew up in a poor country, and this is their first time in the UK as adults, like obviously very clingy to their culture and they're huh. very strict. And I would have very strict, very Egyptian culture in my house. And then I'd go to school. I would go to a friend's house, and it's a very English culture, which is drastically different. And I think it took a while for me to adjust and learn when to change my mindset between different places. Huh. An example of that would be in Egyptian culture. It's very common to eat with hands. So I would grow up eating with my hands. <laughs> I would then go to my friend's house for dinner because his parents were so nice to invite me and the look on people's faces when they see you eating with your hands (laughs) is one that I will never forget. (laughs) (laughs) So... (laughs) What did they do? Like, did you pick up on it immediately? Like, I picked up on the stairs and I kind of started using the spoons and the knives and forks. (laughs) You'd be surprised. They can eat soup with their hands. What? Yes, with breads and dip it in Uh, with their hands. Oh, yeah, I mean... Yeah. But tell that to an English guy and... You know, there was an adjustment period for me growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me a while. And it got to this point where I just know. I just have a switch in my brain. I go to a friend's house and I switch. And Mm -hmm. I would use very polite manners and Mm -hmm. speak to people with respect. And you'd go home, and then you'd switch again, and everyone shouts, and everyone's very loud, and yeah, it's a very different world. It's like jumping between two different worlds Mm -hmm. within the same road. Yeah. That was really interesting to me to hear. Mm -hmm. Also, the religious difference. Yeah. In growing up with that mix of religions. Such stark contrasts between religions as well. Yeah. Egypt is kind of split between Muslims and Coptic Orthodox. Mm -hmm. And my family are the Coptic Orthodox. And the Coptics, they're very proud in that they are one of the oldest religions to date. I didn't know that. They are, yeah. They are very old and they will tell you that whenever they meet you. (laughs) They're very proud of it and because of that they're very strict on their culture. So... I went to a Catholic school, which was kind of counterintuitive. I would go to a Catholic school, I'd come back home, my parents would tell me, don't listen to those Catholics, we were before then. Really? (laughs) Yeah, so it's huge shocks every time I jump between different worlds. Um, It's very confusing. (laughs) Yeah, especially... But because they're very strict, I would grow up in a very strict culture. Especially religion, probably, because religion is like, this is right, this is right. This is right. (laughs) Yeah, to them, it was very black and white, the world. It's very, this is right and this is wrong, according to our religion, according to our culture. And, you know, I would grow up and I'd I'd be like, well, this doesn't make sense. It can't be this black and white. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of confusion growing up. And I think I got to this point as a kid where I just actually, I started refusing my culture, my heritage, because I just didn't like it. And this is actually a reason, I kind of regret it now, but I didn't learn Arabic growing up, as most of my friends did. I just kind of rejected it. Mm -hmm. I kind of didn't like it. I didn't like how strict they were. I I envied my English friends and how relaxed their families were. So I guess I kind of clung on to that, and I I kind of was just like, no, I'm English. I'm not Arabic. I'm not Egyptian. 
and I would refuse to learn Arabic if they tried to teach me. And I'd say, why do I need to learn Arabic? I'm English. I live in England. Mm. And I would just, you know, flat out refuse. And at the time it made sense. Now I'm older, I regret it. I wish I had learned it growing up, then I would be able to speak now. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you had two very, very strong forces pulling you apart. And mm. I mean, I think it would only be natural. There isn't a lot of gray area for mm. your kid to understand. So you, you kind of had to decide. Mm. And I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to like force words in your mouth, but, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it sounds like it's true, it, yeah. you were, you were born there and everybody in your neighborhood was English. Mm. And, and if you were going to choose one, then you chose what a lot of kids would choose probably. Yeah, I think if I was a kid growing up with a really, really strict family that's super different from everybody else, I would probably opt for the alternative option. Yeah. Because that's who you're with, you know. Right, that's more the culture that you are part of actively. Yeah, exactly. It's a very different life to my friends growing up in the UK, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's super interesting. I didn't realize that your that your family's cultural heritage was so strong. Very much so. That yeah. totally makes you a third culture kid, by the way. <laughs> yes, but I mean it's hard to say that when you're born and raised in London. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good segue. Mm. So, and I I talked to him for a while about how people. So don't believe that he's from the UK. So we've talked in the past about how you'll tell people you're from London yeah, and they'll be like, okay, but where are you really from? <laughs> because right. they see that you, you have darker features. Yeah. So how does that reaction usually go? Uh, like walk me through it. It's a strange one. It's, um, it's funny. <laughs> it's like, where are you from? I'd say London, UK. And, you know, they, they pause for a second. They'd be like, right, but where are you from? You know, like hinting, um, obviously not a, a white man, basically. <laughs> and, you know, which surprises me because if you've been to UK, not everyone is white, mm-hmm. surprisingly. Yeah, yeah, they really aren't. They, yeah, so, you know, I would then have to explain to them, well, my family are from Egypt, but I was born in London. Mm-hmm which makes me English. And the reactions I usually get from this is they, they'd assume that I would know a lot about my culture. And I, to be honest, I've only been to Egypt a handful of times when I was a kid, which a lot of I don't actually remember. So really, I don't know a lot about my culture. So, I mean, if you can imagine, like, you're in this situation where you feel... English and you feel you identify with English culture all of your friends growing up were English and then somebody says hey where are you from and you say I'm from England I I was born in England I was raised in England I'm English I've been all over England and then they say oh yeah but where are you really from like I can really see now how that would get so incredibly old they tell me you know oh so you know about the elections happening Heck no. <laughs> Who did you vote for? I, I'm not allowed to vote. I'm not a citizen of Egypt. <laughs> Who did you vote for? So it, it sounds like they, they kind of just, they're like, la, 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 la. <laughs> exactly. They they just assume things. <laughs> yeah. I, I got the vote one a lot during the elections. Who did you vote for? Mm. Like, I'm not legally allowed to vote <laughs> in Egypt. <laughs> That is really funny and and annoying, I'm sure, but like, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. So what percentage of the time do you think you would get that? Uh, okay, so that would be a good, okay, it would be 60%, Jesus. right? Jesus. But there's more. I'd actually say about <laughs> almost the other 40% of people <laughs> would actually assume that I'm Indian Uh because I guess I'm kind of not white but a bit darker Mm -hmm. and not dark dark like a lot of African Egyptians Mm -hmm. Um, and actually in Egypt most people aren't dark dark anyway 
So I'm in this kind of place where a lot of people see me and they think I'm Indian. Mm -hmm. So growing up, a lot of people wouldn't even ask. They mm -hmm. would just say, where from India are you from? <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I'm not from India. <laughs> from England. And then that would go on to the question of, well, where are you from? England. Where are you really from? Egypt. <laughs> So that's where a lot of my conversations go to. Uh, those percentages. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Crazy. And everyone, like 100% of the people doing it wrong. Yeah. That's hard. I mean, 60% are doing the where are you really from mm -hmm. question. And then the rest are assuming. Yeah. Something wrong. And you know what they say when you assume? Mm -hmm. I remember. I know what they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I liked his story about how the guy just randomly came up and started speaking yeah. Hindi to him. They just assume yeah. I'm from India. One guy came up to me in a library and started saying something in Indian to me. In Hindi? Or, in Hindi. Yeah. Or, I don't know what yeah. language. <laughs> and I just... Yeah, right. blankly looked at him and said, excuse me. And he repeated himself in Hindi. And I said, I don't know what you're saying. And this is in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. Yeah. And this is actually a, a white guy. I think he was just trying to impress me with his Indian language skills. Oh, that's so Not realizing awkward. that I'm not Indian. Oh, my God. <laughs> so after the third time of him repeating himself in Indian, I just flat out said, listen, mate, I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> And he just, he apologized to me with a peace sign and hands and bowed and said, I, I thought you could speak Indian. I said, okay. What? That and is he bizarre. moved on. That is bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> so surprisingly, I get Indian a lot. Mm -hmm. People just assuming. You know, if it was an Indian person, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a white person speaking yeah. an Indian language. And I think that really shows that when you're speaking a foreign language, you are still a foreigner. You're still exactly. a guest in that language. Exactly. You're not taking on the responsibility or the... You're not presuming that you know everything about that culture. Yeah. Um, that's such a good point it's the same thing like when people are learning spanish and they go up to anyone who looks even remotely like spanish speaking and start speaking spanish mm -hmm. and maybe they're from egypt maybe their parents are spanish speaking and they're not or maybe they're something completely different mm -hmm. you never know mm -hmm. yeah you always have to be careful and I don't feel like it's about insulting people as much as it is about being sensitive in the acknowledgement of them as an individual, you know? Right. I feel like when you talk to somebody and you automatically think, oh, yeah, I already know. I already know everything about you. Yeah, based on your appearance. Right. Actually, the worst Indian case I had was... Back in the UK, this is back when the movie Slumdog Millionaire just oh, came out. Oh, no. It was really popular. It just came out. And I live in the suburbs of the UK, quite a poor neighborhood. And um, I got on the bus, fairly empty, and these two white old ladies, they come up to me as I'm walking in the bus, and they stop me. You know, they're really smiley and happy and... I had my headphones in. I was on my way to school. I had no idea what was going on. And I took my headphones out. I was like, can I help you? And they were like, can I have your autograph? And they're really cheerful and smiley. And I don't think this was a joke because they're so innocent. And they're so, you know, they generally thought I was him. And I was like, what are you, what are you on about? And they were like, you're from the movie Slumdog Millionaire. You're him, right? And... I feel like now looking back, I probably would have signed it. But at the time, I was very annoyed. I, was, I just walked right past them and there was all this chit chat on the bus of these old ladies telling people and everyone turning and looking at me. And I was very annoyed. And <laughs> I was a kid. And not only that, I was like, if I was 
the actor from Slumlord Millionaire and I made that much money, I would not be going to school in this poor neighbourhood of UK <laughs> on a public bus. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. They did yeah. not think that through, did they? <laughs> no. So that was the worst Indian case I had. Oh my God. So he did talk about how it's a lot different in London. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously I get all of this being, where are you really from? I'm Egyptian and this and that. But then I remember the few times I did go to Egypt and the Egyptian people would be like, oh, he's too English. He's <gasps> not Egyptian. You know, and really? it's like, well, you know, I'm not being accepted by either side now. Mm-hmm. So that was also a weird thing growing up, realizing in UK, you're not English enough, and in Egypt, you're not Egyptian enough. That sounds a little lonely. Yes. The, luckily, I was brought up in London, and London is a very multicultural city. Mm-hmm. So once I left the very white school I was in, I mixed with a lot of multicultural people. That's fun. And you find your scene, and you just become a Londoner. Mm-hmm. At some point, you just become a Londoner. No one really asks you anymore. Everyone just knows they're from London, Mm -hmm. which is a very nice scene. Yeah, that does sound nice. I mean, maybe because trends go from the city to the suburbs, right, usually in that direction. So maybe like in another 200 years, it will be more normal and more accepted when people say they're from a certain place. Yeah, maybe. Have you ever been to a place where... You, like, wouldn't be surprised if somebody said, oh, I'm from this place? Toronto. Oh, yeah. Toronto, for sure. That's a perfect example, actually. Yeah, really diverse. Yeah. Multicultural. Right. I feel like I am a little guilty, though, sometimes, because... I'll meet somebody who has Asian features, for example, and they'll be like, I'm from Toronto. It's like, yeah, I believe, I totally believe that you were born and raised in Toronto. Like, there's no question in my mind, but I'm always curious about them. And I'm always like, oh, I wonder if your mom was from, like, Vietnam and you grew up eating pho. Like, are you first generation? And and I, I do have that curiosity yeah well we'll hear from him like the best way to handle that Mm -hmm. curiosity and that to people who are always like hi where are you from but where are you from i would say embrace the first thing they say the first thing they say is obviously a reason they've said it is because that's what they feel like they belong to you know i i was born and raised in london my whole life i had so much to talk about uk i had so much history there my whole life I've traveled around UK I know so much about different parts of UK and the culture there and I know so much of its history I can go on about it for a long time I could literally say one or two things about Egypt (laughs) yet people seem more interested to ask me questions about Egypt Mm -hmm. and I would tell them I don't know and then that would be the end of the conversation and that's it and they think I'm a boring person Mm -hmm. (laughs) you don't know anything about your life (laughs) And yeah, I'd say get to know where they're actually from, where yeah. they grew up. That's where they have a lot to talk about. I like that. Well, I think on that point, it's just good to bear in mind the time we live in. You know, back in the old days, I guess, the colour of your skin depended how close to the equator you were, I guess, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as a way of evolution and protecting your skin from the sun. Mm-hmm. But now, with modern age and airplanes and the way we are, we're so mixed. I mean, a very clear example of that is all the white people living in Australia, which is not normal. Right. It's part of us moving there, and we've made that we've made Australia into what it is now. And the same for uh, Africa and America and UK and all people from Africa moving out. Right. And we're being forced to move. Or being forced to move. <laughs> All different reasons. For whatever reason, Mm -hmm. the world is completely mixed and matched now. So the colour of your skin is no longer relevant to where you're from. That's that's my thoughts on it. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, no, I totally agree. I think that's some food for thought. Mm. It's one thing to, like, develop a relationship with someone Mm -hmm. and those types of questions 
you know, about each other's backstory. Yeah. And it has to be reciprocal, you know? It yeah. can't be, like, me probing and saying, like, oh, tell me about, like, your great-grandmother mm-hmm. and your whole, like, heritage. Yeah. But a mute. Like, I think it has to be mutual. Yeah, I agree. I think most of the people who would ask that question aren't doing it from a malicious point of view. Or it's not like, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm going to be racist right now. But (laughs) (laughs) yeah, you're right. It is, you know, it's just something I think that people aren't aware of that can be annoying to people. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah, I think it just needs to be, I mean... This is my perspective. Obviously, I'm not an expert, but it needs to be like from a relationship, you know, yeah. not just from a random person. Exactly. That's a really good way to put it. It needs to be from the perspective of getting to know somebody better. Yeah. As opposed yeah, yeah, to, yeah. oh, you're from Toronto. OK, where else are you from? Right. It's just one part of who they are as a person. Exactly. You know? like, yeah. It's not, oh, I see you and I need to know exactly like where you're from from yeah. and your ancestors are from and yeah. I don't know I think in most of my friendships some type of heritage conversation happens definitely and yeah. they might have a European heritage or an Asian heritage or whatever yeah. like my husband um, even Seth is like bright red like totally red dude he's got red hair on his head he's got a red beard he's his face turns red anytime he has an emotion and uh and like guess where he's from (laughs) you're not gonna believe it he's irish yeah (laughs) irish okay (laughs) yeah so so yeah i agree but again that wouldn't be the first thing you asked him like right where are you from but where are you from are you sure you're I know American? that red hair is not really American. <laughs> yeah, totally. I guess, like, that's the thing is I'm genuinely curious about where people are from, and then that's how those conversations start. So this will be the first in a series. We want to get more perspectives on it, and obviously everybody's experience is just totally different. So... We kind of wanted to just listen to Peter and... Yeah, so we really loved hearing his perspective and we're really looking forward to hearing more. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. If you have experience or thoughts on this, we would really love to hear from you. In fact, if you want to come on the show and give your perspective, let us know and we would be happy to reach out to you and talk to you about it and see what you have to say. Yes. We would love that. It would be so cool. We know we don't hear from you very often, but we do have listeners all around the globe. We see where you're listening from. (laughs) Ireland. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so let us know if you'd be interested in that. Yeah, it would be really cool. Yeah, and uh, let us know what you think. And send us your Lost in Translation moment. We would love to hear from you. You can do it over the voice recorder on our website in the contact section, or you can send us a voice memo to languagenerds2earth at gmail.com. Either way is great. Yeah, we'd love to hear your stories. Yeah. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. We'll keep you entertained throughout the week between episodes. Yes. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. That way you'll get fresh episodes every week as we release them. We usually release them on Thursday mornings, China time. And tell your friends if you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Help them subscribe if they don't know how to use podcasts. A lot of people don't. Yeah. Yeah. There have been several people that I've had to literally download it for them. (laughs) But then they can't seem to find it again. So help your friends. Yeah. Help your friends learn about the world. This is very important. Yeah. Yeah. And so our next episode is going to be about summer travel and getting the most bang out of your butt. Out of your butt. It sounded like butt. <laughs> <laughs> getting the most. <laughs> the most bang. The most bang. <laughs> 
<laughs> and getting the most bang for your buck. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And if you'd like to subscribe to our blog, where we also write about traveling and living abroad, then go to our website and give us your email address, and you can get emails every time we update. So, yeah, I think that's it. All right. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Bye.